Well, today we have a special treat uh, that will be bringing the word to you. Uh, Robert Wilson, who serves along with his wife Janine as uh, directors of our life groups, of our community groups, or the way in which we're able to do church right now, uh, they're going to share. Uh, we thank God for them and who they've been. I often tell this story personally. I haven't told this story publicly, but I remember back in 2018 when uh, I saw Rob uh, for the first time at the outlet. And I remember seeing him and I said, it was like a peace, a calm uh, came over me. And I felt like for the first time since launching the church, I was able to take a deep breath. Uh, well, not too long after uh, Janine showed up and just uh, they plugged in not too long after that. And from the time that they've showed up at the outlet, uh, they've been nothing but blessings to our church. Uh, but they've also been blessings to my wife and I personally. And so for this Father's Day, uh, the Lord put it on my heart to have Rob Wilson share uh, as a father, as a grandfather. <laughs> um, uh, deals with blended families, uh, mentors, solid, consistent. And uh, I just pray that you all are able to receive from the grace that's on his life. So let us now welcome the gift of Robert Wilson. My name is Robert Wilson, and I am a director here at the Alla Community with my beautiful wife, Janine Wilson. She is my rock. She is my strength. She encourages me, and she's always fully supporting me. But in reality, she is the lead director <laughs> at the with the Atlanta community as the uh, life group leader. I'm just the Sioux director. I kind of help her out along the way. But anyway, I want to give honor to my pastors, Vincent and Ashley Thomas. They have, have been a blessing to my family. They have been a blessing to my life. And my life has really changed since being involved in the ministry and being directly connected with them. I just thank them for their, their integrity, their transparency, and all they do to grow the Atlanta community and as well impact my family. Today, we we wanna, I want to give honor to fatherhood. I want to give honor to all the fathers, the grandfathers, the uncles, the cousins, anyone that stepped up into the role of father. That could be coaches, teachers, anyone that's spoken to a child's life to edify them or to love them. I want to say thank you and happy Father's Day to you. What you do is important, it's meaningful, and the world is blessed as a result of it. So happy Father's Day. So the pastor charged me to talk about fatherhood. And on top of that, he called me old. But anyway, I'm going to get past that. <laughs> but uh, it, it's an honor to be able to speak uh, and allow God to use me in his role. So before I get started, I'm going to do a really quick prayer. Father, thank you for choosing me as a vessel of honor and to be used by you to minister the word today. May I totally diminish and it be all about you and speaking to your people. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now, the role of fatherhood is really important. As fathers, we're charged to provide, we're charged to lead, protect, nurture, and grow. The responsibilities are large and that sometimes can seem overwhelming. And it's fair to say that the successfulness of our families can hinge on how effective we are in executing the responsibilities of fatherhood. I want to say can be, because nothing's absolute as being a Christian, because there's always God. Again, we are not alone in executing this role. Our families are doomed, are not doomed to fail if, a, if the person in the role of father in our lives does not rise to the occasion or rise to the role of fatherhood. God deemed the role so important that he agreed to fill in when fatherhood isn't present in our life, directly present in our life. Psalms 68, 5, 6 says, he is the father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. So we are not alone as fathers, nor are our, families, our family experience doomed to fail when fatherhood is not present. A lot of people uh, know me, but don't know me. So I want to give you a little bit of background about me. When I was, uh, you know, my mother and father divorced when I was an infant. So my father was present but he wasn't present to the extent that I thought he should be. He, uh, he lived near and he remarried and he had another family. So I kind of felt, as in my young mind, I kind of felt that I lived on the wrong side of the track as a result of him and his new life and he lived on the good side of the track. 
And what that did to me is that created jealousy. I was jealous of the fact that it seemed that he had a better life with his new family. I was envious. In fact, I was envious of other guys that had fatherhood in their life. And I took it to the extent that I had a built-in excuse in my life that as a result of growing up with a father, that you had advantages over me. You, 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 you had more confidence over me. And I started to make excuses for some of my shortcomings as a result of not having a father in my life. And I became angry and uh, as a result. And uh, one thing I did that I, I remember very clearly in college, I came to my father because I needed some help with something. And I, I, uh, he, he did help me, but he didn't help me the way I thought he should. So in, in going back to school, I made a vow. I said, you know what? I'm not going to ask for help on anything anymore. I'm my own man. I could do this thing on my own. I don't need anybody to give me help. I don't want to rely on anybody but myself. And as I learned as a Christian, vows can be detrimental down the road, and we'll talk about that. But one thing that, I, one thing that I learned in my journey is that we have to get past the point that, uh, that even if our fathers were not in our lives, we can't base our lives based on what we thought our fathers should or should not have done in our lives. We got to get past that hurt, that disappointment. In some cases, deep hurt. You know, some people have experienced some rough stuff as a result of fathers, but not fatherhood in their life. And that's real. But we got to get past that point. The framework of our lives cannot be based on what our, fam our fathers did or didn't do. We are here because of our fathers. Again, we would not exist if our fathers didn't procreate to make us exist in this world. So, and God has given us grace, and as, as God has given us grace to forgive, we have to find a place in our heart to forgive our fathers for what they did or didn't do. Remember, the role is tough, and some men just did not have the opportunity or the experience or the know-how or knowledge or the connections to navigate that role in, their, in fatherhood, and it left a void in their lives. And as the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. So. But more importantly than just concentrating on that aspect of it, this is about your healing. You see, the anger you hold towards fathers plays a part, plays a part in how you receive God the Father. You see, the walls you put up to, in my situation to protect myself keep me from experiencing the vast goodness of God, the vast love of God, the daily interactions that he wants to have with me and the guidance that he wants to provide me. See, trust is hard when you have harbor bitterness in your heart. Heart. So like I said, when I, when I developed those vows, I had bitterness in my heart. And it's hard to hear from God when you're carrying that weight and that anger and that bitterness in your heart. You got to find a way to, to seek healing. You got to find a way to get forgiveness. Now, each person's journey towards forgiveness is, is different. You know, there's no cookie cutter approach. Some people might not have, this, have the, the ability to meet with their father. Some people might not have a chance to reconcile directly with their father. But you have to take that journey to find a way to find forgiveness in your heart. You know, the thing is, the walk is difficult. Forgiveness is difficult, but it's necessary to put you in a position to hear from God. And to drill down further, you need to be in a position to hear from God. I like to sometimes tease my wife because as I got older, as Pastor Benny likes to say, <laughs> When I read, sometimes I need to wear reading glasses. So sometimes I'll borrow my wife's reading glasses, and uh, she wears them on her head sometimes. So when I'm borrowing them, they're really, <laughs> they're really spotty. And I'm like, how can you see through these glasses? And when you have that bitterness in your heart, that's how you're looking at life. Your, life, your, your vision is stained by your past experiences, and you're not able to see clearly in regards to how God wants to operate in your life. So a little bit more about me. You know, uh, me and my wife, when we first met, we, uh, as we got married, we used to challenge each other, not from a competition standpoint, but to challenge each other to be better in a certain area in our lives. And uh, so we were married, and I think we were about maybe a year into marriage. My wife said to me, what are you going to do about your father's relationship? Uh, I'm like, what are, what are you talking about? I'm good. He good. We all good. And she said, no, what are you going to do? about mending that relationship. I was like, no, he hurt me. He left me. He abandoned me. You know, why I got to do something? She says, but you're a grown man now, and you have the ability to do something about it. Now, this is where the competitive part of me kicked in. I ain't going to be no punk in front of my wife. <laughs> I'm going to find a way to do this thing. So I mustered up the courage to, 
called my father up and I said, Dad, you know, let's go out to lunch. And what's, what's, what's important about that initial conversation with him, because it was the first time as a man, I spoke to my dad as a man and I was willing to meet with my dad as a man. So, you know, I, I went in with no expectations and uh, we went to a restaurant together and we sat down and talked. And I don't know if you know the prodigal son experience where the prodigal son had all of these words built up and ready to say to his father in regards to being accepted. Well, it was funny because my father <laughs> kind of had the same kind of response where he was wanted to talk about the things that he didn't do and he was sorry. And uh, the one thing that came to my heart right now is all of that didn't matter anymore because what was most important to me at that moment was that he wanted to have a relationship with me just as much as I wanted to have a relationship with him. So we sat down and we talked and I was like, Dad, you know, I, I don't care. I, I don't care what it should have been. All I do know is that we can control what it can be. And I wanna, I wanna be able to talk to you. I wanna be able to meet with you. I wanna be able to just connect with you. I wanna connect with you different than any experience we've had up to this point. And he agreed to it. And from that point, that changed the dynamics of my relationship with my dad. So as I was saying earlier, uh, this role as fatherhood, it wasn't meant for us necessarily to do it by ourselves. John 14, 26 says, but when the father sends the advocate as my representative, this is Jesus speaking, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and he will remind you of everything I've told you. See, God never said we were alone in fulfilling the role of fatherhood. He even promised that we would never, he would never leave us or forsake us. See, he promised to be a present help in a time of need, and he promised to give us access to all the knowledge that we need. He's there for us. We're not, we're not, we're not supposed to be able to do this by ourselves. We're supposed to do this with his help and guidance. And as Pastor has taught in this past series, we're stewards of this role of fatherhood. And he's there to help us, guide us through the, through the road. So I'll give you a little bit more about me. And again, I consider this, this is my journey through fatherhood. And I hope this is blessing you. And I hope this connects with some experiences you might have had in your, in your journey through fatherhood. So as, as a father, you know, uh, you know, me and my wife, my, I had two young kids. I had a son who was about to go into high school. And I had a, a younger daughter who was in, I think, grammar school at the time. And uh, again, with fatherhood, there's responsibilities and decisions that you have to make along the way, and sometimes you just don't know what to do. So I was at a job at, the, uh, at that particular time in my life. I had a horrible manager that my work experience was tough. It was, it was so tough to the extent that my wife and I went on vacation, and even at the, tail of my vacation, at the tail end of my vacation, I couldn't even enjoy the experience because I was so concentrated and concerned about going back to work and all the things that I had to face in that work environment. So it was tough. And again, my, my oldest son at the time, he was about to go to high school. So he, he, he's a, a quiet kid in the school that we were about to have to have him go to was starting to get a little bit more aggressive. And I thought it would be detrimental to his overall growth and confidence to go to that school. So we looked around, and again, we lived in New Jersey at the time. We looked around at other schools, but the cost of living and taxes and everything like that just was too expensive. So, but what do I do? I, I can't throw him to the wolves you know, but I can't afford to move. What do I do? So I had a, you know, you know, I was back to work and in the middle of the night, I just woke up and I had this unction in my heart. It was, I believe it was God speaking to me and he said, move to Atlanta. I was like, move to Atlanta? He said, move to Atlanta. Leave the job and move to Atlanta. So I woke my wife up and I said, honey, I believe God told me to move to Atlanta and leave the job. She says, well, what are you gonna, uh, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna follow the instructions? And she was, I mean, really supportive. She didn't question how I was just hearing stuff. She believed that God spoke to me and she was 100% behind me in whatever decision I decided to make. So I decided to move as God told me. So I put in my notice at my job. And let's, I, wanna, I wanna put this in context. This was probably around October or November of the year. And I felt a little awkward. I felt a little embarrassed because I didn't have anything to fall back on other than the word of God. You know, I'm telling my, uh, my, my, uh, my boss, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm going to leave the job. And uh, they're like, well, what opportunities are you, are you pursuing? I said, I'm working on that. <laughs> but then working on that was trusting in God. So at the same time, I got my house repaired in New Jersey. And again, this is in the, in the uh, late fall around Thanksgiving. And I put my house up for the market to sell. Now, if you know anything about real estate, that's the worst time of the year <laughs> to put your house up for the market because people are getting set for the holidays. 
you know, you're not going to get the traffic to come through your house. All that stuff was going on, but I still trusted in God. So I had, uh, I, I started the process. I had my plans on what I was going to do. I was going to fly down Atlanta, interview this, that, and the other. And somehow out of the blue, I got a call from a company that said, Robert, uh, we, we saw your resume. We're interested in talking to you. I said, well, I'm ready to fly down to Atlanta. They said, no, you don't have to fly down to Atlanta. We have a local office where we want you to go in, and we'll do a teleconference interview with you down here in Atlanta. Now, I want to put this in perspective. This is like 20 plus years ago. This, is before, this was before Zoom meetings. This stuff didn't happen. This was supernatural going on here. So what they told me basically was that uh, we want to bring you on board. We like your resume. We like what you're telling us. Uh, we're going to pay you more than what you were paying, were paid in your job in New Jersey. And at that time, it was a stigma that if you moved to the South, salaries were cheaper. <laughs> they were willing to pay me more, but I had to take a role that was a little bit less until the manager role that I was supposed to be placed in would come open. So I said, all right. So me and my family moved. And actually, on Christmas Day, well, me back up a little bit. Our house sold. <laughs> so actually, on Christmas Day, I was driving to Atlanta to start my second portion of my life. I had no control of that. I had no idea how God was going to navigate my life. I had no idea how I was going to get another job. I had no, no idea how I was going to sell my house. But the one thing I did have was trust that God was going to come through for me. But the biggest thing that I learned through that experience was that when God blesses you, it's not just about you. Because all the people that follow my family down to the Atlanta after a result of us moving were blessed. There's new marriages in place. There's new children in place. There's grandchildren. There's people living in beautiful homes. There's people in great jobs. This just got moving through my willingness and obedience to listen to him bless others. So when you're listening to God, it's not necessarily just about you. It's about what he wants to do through you, but it's about your willingness to listen to him and to respond to what he's telling you to do. So what I want to... Uh, what I want to conclude on is a couple of key points. I don't want to give you no five keys of being a great father because that's not me. I just want to talk to you about how God has impacted me and I think how he can impact you the same way. I want you to first, first step into fatherhood. Be fathers. As long as you have breath in your body and ability to speak and live, you have a chance to make a difference. But what it starts with is truly and deeply allowing Jesus to be a part of your life and to, and to allow him into your heart and trust what he's saying to you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect as a father. We're not perfect as fathers. We're going to make mistakes, but he is perfect. And on top of him being perfect, he has given us grace. So he's given us another day to take another bite at the apple to be the father that God desires for us to be. So allow Jesus in your heart Allow him to speak to you. Clear up all that baggage that's stopping you from hearing from him clearly. Allow him to speak to your heart so that you can receive all that he has for you so that you can execute the role of fatherhood in excellence. Use the voice that God gave you to make a difference. You know, in the beginning, God came to Adam and God said, you name, you name all the creatures. And Adam named them, and that's what they became. He named the lions, the elephants, whatever it was. He used his voice to name them, and that's what it became. As fathers, we have a voice. Our voice is powerful. Our voice is meaningful. And our voice has impact. Use, uh, use your voice when you're communicating with your wife, spouse, or significant other. In that when you involve another person in your life, it's your responsibility in the role of fatherhood to make them better than what they were before they met you. See, they came from a father. And there was a standard set, whether it was good or bad, it was set. So as a father, as a, in the role of fatherhood with that spouse, wife, or other, it's your responsibility to speak edifying words into their life, to build them up, to make them a better person, to create a better situation for them. And you can do that through the guidance and experience, I mean, through the guidance and revelation of the Holy Spirit in your life. Speak life into your kids. You know, it's easy to be critical. It's easy to judge where they should be at. It's easy to, to find the, the flaws, and it's easy to to just try to dictate what you think they should, but speak life into them. Encourage them. Tell them that they're, that they're good, they're worthy, they're valuable. They're getting it from the outside. We should be as fathers speaking life to them from the inside. 
Let me give you a follow-up on that one story I gave you a little bit earlier. So I started the new job in Atlanta, and uh, after the year went by, I uh, was called into my manager's office. He said, it's time for you to step into that manager's role. I was like, all right, I'm ready. My family was settled. Everything was going good. So when I was riding home from work that day, first time in my life, I had an anxiety attack. And what came back to mind was the experiences I had with the former boss in my former job in New Jersey. I felt, the, I felt like, man, is it going to be that experience again? And am I going to go through that whole tension and not want to go to work and feeling tense coming out of vacation? And I mean, I started sweating and my heart started palpitating. I'd never felt that before, but it was real to me. And in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit said, call your dad. So I, I, I call my dad, call your dad. So I picked up the phone and I called my dad. And man, I was like, dad, you know, I, I, I got promoted to my new role at my new job down here. And he was like, he's like, Rob, he said, you know, he calls me Bobby. He says, Bobby, I'm so proud of you. He says, you're just, he says, you're, you're just, you're, he says, you're my smartest kid. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I think that was him souping me up a little bit. But that was cool because I needed it at the moment. But it, he made me feel good. He spoke into my life. And for the, one of the first times in my life, you know, I heard, it was almost like God talking to Jesus. This is my son and I'm so well pleased. And I, I felt that I could do it. I called my wife afterwards. I told her, and she did her normal thing of encouraging me, but speaking into my life, even as an older adult, meant something to me and gave me the extra oomph that I need to walk in that new role, that new responsibility that I took on at my job. So speaking to your kid's life and speaking to your friend's life. If you're a friend with somebody, you have the ability to speak life into them. Be honest, be truthful. Tell them what they need to hear in love because you have a voice, you have power in your voice. And, and one, uh, one final thing I want to emphasize is pass on your gift. You have the gift as a father to mentor, to do something for somebody else. You, you have a gift that people need to hear. You have the ability to empower somebody just by being a father. So put yourself in a position of being a mentor. Put yourself in a position of being a leader. Put yourself in a position of impacting someone's life. Speak against injustice. Again, we have a voice as men. And one of the things I think that's different in life from when I grew up was that the older guys dictated what went on in the neighborhoods, but now we're kind of pulling back as men and not saying anything. Speak against injustice, be wise, use wisdom, follow the Holy Spirit, but speak against injustice. Use your voice and lead by example. Be that leader in your family, be that leader in your community, be that leader at your job. Be that leader in your church environment. Be that leader because you are equipped to be that leader through the guidance and instructions and the wisdom given to you by the Holy Spirit. And finally, stand for what's right. It's easy to deviate from what's right. Stand for what's right because people are watching you. And again, we're not perfect and sometimes we may miss the mark. But when we do miss the mark, we got the next day. Let's get back on path and pursue excellence pursue worthiness, pursue all that God has given us a responsibility to do, to be the fathers that God called us to be. Your family needs you, your community needs you, the body of Christ needs you, and you're equipped, you're ready, you're able, and you can do the job. Thank you. Service was amazing. I'm so appreciative of this time. And now we're gonna delve into announcements. So yeah, we're about to clean up y'all. So get them holy sweatpants, them little raggedy shirts, and get prepared to clean up our community. We will be doing so on June the 26th. Please make sure that you sign up. Also, 4th of July is coming and we are going to see each other in person. So on July the 4th, which is a Sunday, we are going to have outside worship at King Middle School. So please bring your chairs, do not bring your fireworks. We won't hear enough of those from June the 4th to August the 4th, but just make sure you bring your chairs, bring something comfortable, and be prepared to celebrate with family. Thank you so much, and I hope you have an amazing day.